for that welcome. I'm Stan Grant, here to give you some answers tonight. Best-selling author Grace Tame, independent MP for Wentworth, Allegra Spender, New South Wales Treasurer Matt Keane, Republican, Olympian and former Labor Senator Nova Peris, and ABC broadcaster Josh Zepps. Please make them all feel welcome. I just want to ask the most obvious question. Respectfully, why is it that there must be a constitutional voice for the 812,000 Australians who identify themselves as Indigenous when they're already represented by Linda Burney, uh, she herself being of uh, Aboriginal background? Actually, why should a particular ancestry be, uh, have the monopoly on, on voice to Parliament? Why can't we have the, um, uh, you know, uh, a voice for the almost 1.4 million Chinese Australians as well? Uh, really, surely any voice to parliament must have its foundation on fairness to all Australians. You would agree on that? Nova. First came off the rank, eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you know, like, you've obviously come here, you've acknowledged that you're Chinese. Um, but you've come here with your identity. You've come here with your language. You've come here for freedom. And we as First Nations people, Aboriginal peoples, you know, everything about us has been denied. So much so that in 1992, you know, uh, the High Court decision um, with the terra nullius notion. So everyone came here with the notion that this was no man's land. So it's... You're not the only one that's asked that question. But for us as First Nations peoples, we've, we've been locked out for so, so long. You know, the wars of discrimination has kept us out. And, you know, myself as a former Olympian, or I shouldn't say a former, I'm once always Olympian, always an Olympian. An Olympian. <laughs> you know, for me to go to other countries around the world wearing a green and gold tracksuit and people asking me what country I come from, and I say, I'm an Aboriginal woman, and people say, oh, do Aboriginal, you know, black people mm. exist in your country. So for us, it's, it's timely, you know, we, We've been crying out to be heard for so, so long. And um, you're not the most impoverished person on this country, us. We're the most incarcerated, the sickest. Um, you know, um, the other home care statistics, you know, um, I was floored by the uh, clo Closing the Gap um, report when it had 22,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children a year mm. being taken off their parents. You know, and only 16 returned. There's a big problem in this country. And, you know, we are an industry. People make profit of us being sick and incarcerated and not being part of equality in this country. So it's timely. And if you can't see us as the First Nations people and everyone's come to this country for freedom, you know, everyone has benefited from our, the injustices that have occurred to First Nations people in this country. Right, but... <clears throat> Is this part of the argument? I mean, one thing that whenever we have conversations about this on my radio show, part of the argument of people who oppose the voice mm. is that all of the things that you're talking about, the higher rates of incarceration, the higher rates of infant mortality, the, you know, the, high, the, the inferior rates of, of health care, that those things are where we should actually be focusing on and mm. that, you know, quasi-symbolic things like a voice to parliament or recognition in the constitution don't necessarily affect those things so that maybe there are more practical things that can be done than a voice. Well, it's interesting because Ken Wyatt said um, that he wanted something legislated. And I sort of feel that, you know, when I was in Parliament, um, when I gave my last speech in 2016 on closing the gap, I recited words from Neville Bonner's 1971 mm. opening the, the, speech. The first Aboriginal person. As the first Parliament, Aboriginal yeah. person, the year that I was born. And so a lot of things haven't changed. And if we don't really prioritise things, and, you know, people are saying, well, why do we have to have an Aboriginal? Because, you know... I guess for us, why are we still talking about it? Because it's a big problem and it is a national shame, you know, how we are treated and with the incarceration rates and, and again, you know, the discrimination um, in, in so many systems, the systems of governance, and it, it's not going to go away. But if you got rid of all of those disparities, mm. then would the justification for a voice cease to be compelling? Surely not. Well, for me, like, I'm really scared about going to a referendum. Because referendums, you know, we've had eight 
successful in 47 yeah. however many referendums and we saw what happened when we went to the public around marriage equality you know why can't people love each other for whatever sex they are but for us we want to be recognised, but in a way, and a lot of mob are calling out for treaties, you know, you speak mm. to the Yolongal mob, they've asserted their sovereignty, a lot of mob have for, for a long time, and we want to make sure that a voice doesn't cede just, the sovereignty and doesn't take away the treaty. Ju just on that, I want to come up to mm. the other, other panellists in just a moment, but just on that, we'll go to a video from Pengate Bray. My name, Pengate Bray, Mabatwa Aranta man. I am 72 years of age, a traditional owner of Alice Springs. In all my years, I have not seen any government, no matter who they are in power, do anything for us territory blackfellas. So what my question is, what is the uh, power of the voice? It's going to be another kick in the guts for us poor people. Thank you. Matt. Yeah. Well, uh, I respectfully disagree. I don't think the voice is going to divide our country. I think it's an opportunity to unite our country. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to undermine our democracy. I think it's going to strengthen it. Mm -hmm. It's certainly what's not what the Nationals um, said this week. And well, your, your, your federal coalition partners, your state coalition partners, is this... You think they're wrong in coming out and opposing it in the way they did this week? Well, I disagree with their position, very much so. And I recognise that there are good people in the National Party, like Michael McCormack and Andrew G, that have different views to the, their colleagues. Um, and that's great. And it just shows that the diversity within our political system, uh, the diversity of views within our political system on these issues, within our political parties, as there are across the community. But um, as Nova rightly said, it's an opportunity for us to recognise the atrocities and injustices that have occurred in the past, mm -hmm. and an opportunity to recognise the entrenched uh, discrimination and uh, uh, inequality that uh, manifests itself still today, and an opportunity for us to move forward together mm -hmm. to a positive future. That's the opportunity the voice gives it, and we should grab it with both hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And look, I, I think too, so I think I appreciate you asking the question because it's this is the dialogue we as a country need to have in a really respectful way. And you know, I'll tell you why the two reasons I support the voice. The first is that when you are making laws for people, if you don't listen to them and you don't understand what they actually want, then you will fail them. And I think this is the point, you know, when you raise the question, shouldn't we get services, shouldn't we focus on that? The point is we've been making services for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander for years and decades without actually really understanding what they as community want. And all the evidence shows that if you really empower the community to say this is what we need, then you get better outcomes. And this is about having better outcomes. And thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. But the second reason is when we, when in 1901, when our constitution came into being, there were no Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voices, even though these were the people who'd been living in this country for 60,000 years. And I think as a country, as we think about how we move forward, we must recognise the enormous contribution of the people and move forward as one country that recognises that special bond. So that, for me, is that's about us as a wonderful Australian nation going forward, which recognises you know, so many different parts of a wonderful nation, but we must recognise that. Grace, Nova said before she's, she's worried, though, about a referendum, and she referenced um, the, the marriage equality plebiscite, which ultimately was carried. Mm -hmm. But these things can be very hurtful and very divisive campaigns. Do you share those concerns that Nova has? Oh, look, it's, it's, it's all very difficult. You know, the devil is in the detail, and, mm. and, and attention to detail in, in this day and age is, is a dying art. And so I'm, I sit here <laughs> <laughs> listening very carefully uh, and... and and respectfully, as, as somebody who knows this isn't my issue to speak on, it's my issue to, to listen to uh, and, and to, to sit with uh, the experts, and the experts in this case are the, uh, are the Indigenous uh, um, community members. And as you say, there is division, there's discord within that community, which makes it difficult. Uh, and it seems, though, overwhelmingly, that people in the Indigenous community do want the voice. And for reasons that 
uh, Nova was saying and that you mm. echo as well, mm. is that when we're making laws and we're trying to drive positive change, we need to defer to those people. And but that's what's that's what's important. I mean, and, and you, the question that you asked, though, was about, um, you know, the, the, the difficulty that, that, that can arise. That and we know how divisive these things can be, don't we? Yes, it's... That's what's really... It's what, what's really difficult is that there's, there's uh, labels, you know, <laughs> and we're talking about all these different things, whether it's LGBTQI or, um, you know, First Nations or, uh, you know, in my case, you know, people always refer to me as a child sexual abuse survivor or whatever it is. The thing is, there's a difference between uh, using something uh, to, to label somebody, uh, um, you know, for, for the purposes of education, and identity, or to put someone in a box, you know? Uh, a definition is not uh, the same thing as division. It's helpful in forming understanding, but a definition is not an end point. Mm -hmm. It's a building block. Mm. And, and that's really important to create that distinction. Uh, and, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking in platitudes here, but, but I, I guess it's the truth, really. Mm. Just um, on, the, on the question of the divisiveness of the referendum, <laughs> can I just pipe up and put in a, a defence of democracy and a defence of the rambunctious divisiveness that it entails, in the sense that, I mean, I think what you were saying, Allegra, is, is, is totally right, that, I mean, I wasn't putting forward a particular opinion mm. of mine. I was just saying that we live in a very... in a society mm. that, thankfully, has a huge diversity of opinion, not mm. just, you know, yeah. across every metric. I mean, even within the Indigenous community itself, you have a difference of opinion. Um, I'm a bloke who's married to another bloke. We went through that referendum. Uh, it was a little bit dirty. It was a little bit feisty. Guess what? That's the nature of living in a civil society where there are disagreements. There are going to be disagreements. There are going to be people... You know, there's going to be a bit of sledging and there's going to be a bit but of... We, we also that. know, Josh, it's, it's how you disagree when you're mm -hmm. dealing with with communities that are very traumatised, mm, yeah. uh, then that becomes very much more sensitive. Of course, but, I mean, to move forward, you're going to have to cop a bit, aren't you? Mm. So We've can been I, copying can a lot of it for a long, long time, though. <laughs> <laughs> let's be... Let's make it yeah. <laughs> no, well, I, I, I do need to move on, but I... I do need to move on, but I want to finish uh, with you on this, because Pengate raised something um, that I think you were also alluding to, and that is that... In our communities, First Nations communities, there is also differences of opinion on this. You were just in, in Canberra. You were taking the, the temperature, having meetings with people. You're out in communities as well. Where does this land with First Nations people? Well, I guess, yeah, I was in Canberra yesterday on the floor um, of Parliament when I um, heard the Prime Minister deliver his speech and the opposition mm. um, leader as well. And, you know, I took a Tiwi lady in because she felt that her voice wasn't being ad heard. And Uncle there from um, Central Australia feels like consecutive governments. And I know that because, like I said, my last speech and our lives have been used as political footballs. Every time a cycle of government comes around. Um, at the end of the day, I feel that there is some sort of merit in this. And if we don't start doing something differently, nothing will change. Mm. And, and this voice, who is going to be in the voice? Because I know myself that we as Aboriginal people, I know a lot of mob listening would agree with me, that there we have our mission managers, we have our gatekeepers, and there are people in government who do not want us, like I said, to, to be able to enjoy the freedom that everyone else, because we are a commodity. You know, our misery is a commodity for a lot of people. And, and you know, we just want to be equal, we want to be free, mm -hmm. and you need to understand our starting point. Yeah. You know, we, we've, we've endured a lot of trauma in this country for a lot of years. And it's 2022, 2023 next year, and we've got to start doing things differently. Yeah. It is interesting, though... Sorry. No. <laughs> It's interesting, though. So before the show, I just happened to be talking to Dr Tracy Westerman, who's mm -hmm. an Indigenous psychologist. And one of the things that we come across with in the sector that I work in, which is fighting pedophiles, which is great fun. <laughs> That's a joke. And not literally, obviously. That would make for <laughs> quite a spectacle. Um, <laughs> ooh. Um, <laughs> is that data can be manipulated just as easily mm. as minds can. And, you know, we were talking before about, uh, you know, and we heard from the, um, 
Indigenous man before in that video, you know, about the, you know, the poorer communities and the mm -hmm. representation in these poorer areas. And, you know, a lot of the data from those areas is not necessarily the truth. And so, mm. you know, are we hearing, mm. are we hearing the truth of the stories and the representation from the poorer people and from the poorer communities and what they really have to say about this issue. Mm. So before we actually move on, I do yeah. actually wonder, is that yeah. something? Which, which was the, the point you were making. making. Yeah. yeah, about the people in the community. Yeah. You know, it's, it's tiring being so impoverished and yeah. it's so tiring picking up the newspaper and seeing all these deficit statistics mm. about our lives, yep. you know, yeah. and it's, it's really draining on our young kids to keep yep. picking up the newspaper and reading that. So, um, you know, if, if, if we can do something different and the model's right, um, it's something that all Australians should embrace because you can't move out forward as a nation without understanding the history of this country. Mm. There has been a fierce campaign against Qatar hosting the World Cup. The country's religion and values dictate a certain stance on the consumption of alcohol, on LGBT matters, in fact, any public display of affection or sexuality. And they're happy that way. Why should the West shove so-called liberal values down others' throats? And what puts us in a better moral stance anyway? Our horrendous invasion of Iraq or our treatment of refugees in detention centres? And on another, on another note, we should advocate for the rights of migrant workers. But why this selective attention? Why well, lots of our own clothing is made by oppressed, underpaid workers. If you were Qatari or Muslim, wouldn't you feel like this is a racist, targeted campaign filled with hypocrisy? Josh. Well, I might feel that way. I'd be mistaken uh, if, if I did feel that way. Uh, I don't think that we need to... Look, there, I mean, there are a couple of things going on. Uh, there, is a, there is a lot more that you can achieve by doing business with uh, awful states than by excluding them from the community of nations. So I, I don't think that, you, that excluding Qatar from being able to host something like the World Cup actually achieves anything. Mm. We've been able to achieve successful reforms in, in Qatar by pressuring them on human rights and so on. They're certainly likely to be more open and less regressive than they would have been had the World Cup mm. never happened in Qatar. But on the question of whether or not we have anything to be proud of in the West, whether or not we have a leg to stand on, uh, I do fear that we're losing our sense of what, what made us uh, as successful as we are. And, I mean, this is a delicate thing to talk about, but I hear it all the time from listeners. I hear a, a, a fear that we're getting so... Uh, kind of intellectually tied up in, in our own knots about how bad we are and our participation in the Iraq war and our participation in global capitalism and what an irredeemably white supremacist country we are, that we've lost our ability to speak clearly about problems in other countries. I, th I, think, I think the question, though, was... Yes, there was some moral relativism in the question, but the question also went to hypocrisy. Um, does he have a point about hypocrisy? Uh, yes, I think you're always going to be hypocritical. I think any uh, because we're all <laughs> imperfect, there's always going to be an element of hypocrisy to any charge. But I don't think that you can compare a regime like Qatar's to Australia. As, as a sports person, um, Nova, what went through your mind when you competed? Because of course, you know, any country that hosts these big events are going to be open to scrutiny. Australia's hosting the, the, the Women's World Cup next year mm -hmm. and our people are the most impoverished and imprisoned people in the, in the country, if not in the world. Mm. Um, and yet Australia will be hosting that event. 2032, the Olympics will be in, in Brisbane. Um, and again, First Nations questions or questions of treatment of refugees. What can sport bring to highlight these issues and bring about change? Well, sports... To me, it's, it's an equaliser to begin with, like in terms of if you're an athlete, like there'd be so many, I'm sure, soccer players that are there who've come from impoverished backgrounds mm. and education and sport are our equalisers mm. in life. I know myself, when I competed at the Sydney Olympics, there was um, a number of us Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander athletes that competed. I remember I was asked to boycott because mm. of you know, the circumstance of Aboriginal and people. And I remember Charlie Perkins saying, burn, Sydney, burn, you know, going into those And, and I remember games. you running with the torch and I was mm. there with you and you ran barefoot. In barefoot to make the statement, didn't mm. you? I did, because people had said, you know... Um, and it was three weeks before the Olympic trials and I ran 1.9 kilometres barefoot. <laughs> 
um, zero degrees and I didn't get a stone blister that whole time and the fl Olympic flame went out bloody three times that day. <laughs> <laughs> so there were spirits looked after me but the point was people had said is it an honour, you know, first of 10,000 people to carry the Olympic flame. Mm. Yes, it's an honour but you know what? The people on one side of the rock, the people, the, the five star resort, yeah. they forget that on the other side of the rock, the Murujulu people live in fourth world conditions. You know, they're living off a diesel generator. So sport is also a platform where people come from those impoverished countries that we use it to elevate, a, give themselves a voice to address certain mm. things. And what I think this can do is like what you said, you know, let's hope that after the soccer, our human rights issue is going to get better. But you're right, Stan, in, in you know, what's going to happen with the 2032, I know the 2032 Olympics was one on the, an Aboriginal touch on and a legacy that's going to be left, mm. get left behind. That was a big part in Australia winning. So, like I said, it's important to have all these, all our ducks and lines to ensure that, you know, there aren't mm. going to be the protests that we, we but can. It, but it does provide a platform. I, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. it's not going to go away. Athletes will always use that platform. And we've seen that. It, we've, we've seen, seen that it. in Qatar. It goes back to 1956 Olympics as well. That's right, with mm. uh, Tommy, Tommy Smith and, yep. and, and John I'm Carlos. sad to hear about the death of... Cons of Christine McVie, as she's been inspirational to me in my own performing arts journey, especially the song Don't Stop, which has given me a lot of hope in overcoming challenges and trauma that I've endured in my life. My question is to Grace, do you ever feel like stopping? You're such a fierce advocate and inspiration, but I wonder, have you ever felt like stopping the work because of the media backlash and challenges that you faced? How can you continue to give young girls like me hope to keep advocating for change in this world and what are your top three tips? Mm. Well, done. well, first of all, thank you very much. Um, you know what? I'll be honest with you. Because <laughs> um, that's all I can be. Um, the honest answer is yes, I do. Sometimes. Um, I've had a really hard 24 hours, actually. Um, you know, this morning I was meeting with the uh, Department of Public Prosecutions because uh, the child sex offender who abused me and um, others have alleged uh, they've abused him as well. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, that would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, you know, he, he has been menacing and harassing me this year. Um, and the thing is that he hasn't really stopped um, for the last 12 years um, uh, behind the scenes, um, you know. And, 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 that's, and the, that's the and background. And there's a court issue that's as the, well. Yes, that's it? the background context, you know, in which I sort of wrote my mm. book. And it's also the sort of background context of my life. Um, and the, the, this work is not easy. This sector is very fraught. It's a very traumatised um, world. Um, that everyone operates in who fights against child sexual abuse. Uh, but it's also the most rewarding. And the most rewarding part of it for me is connections like this, <laughs> the ones that I have in private with people who have also been through this. And like I said before, you know, it's one in six boys and one in four girls. Mm -hmm. And it's probably an underreported statistic because of the mechanism of shame that is driven by people like that man, mm -hmm. who is a coward by the way, those people are cowards who do this, who try to drive wedges between men and women. That doesn't actually exist, OK? There isn't a wedge between us or any wedge anywhere. It affects all of us. It's as indiscriminate as life itself. And when I get to meet people who have also been through this. And I've travelled around the country. I've been very, very fortunate to get to do this work. And when I shared a story on the project about a man who came up to me in Perth, who, uh, who when, when I met him, all he could do at the time was just reach out a pinky finger. And I knew, I knew. He was in his 50s. He would have probably went, you know, been, I don't know, 55 or something like that. And when we had a hug, afterwards I learnt that he hadn't had the courage to shake anyone's hand for about 10 years. And then I was in Townsville mm -hmm. and then somebody had heard that story, then he reached out his pinky finger, mm -hmm. you know. And now I go around the country and people will just reach out their pinky finger and I have all these, you know, and it's this domino effect where people are 
finding the courage within themselves. And I had that happen with me. The first mm. survivor who ever, um, you know, I, I ever met who was a fellow s survivor, um, that, that, that happened, they were the person for me who did that, you know? And everybody can be somebody's someone mm. as well. And it's a beautiful thing. So I do think about stopping sometimes, but I think about that effect mm. more than anything. And it's this lattice work of change that we're forming and we're standing up to these people. And so, yeah, I do. I get down and out sometimes, but I, I never give up because mm. I think about the people who we're doing this for and it's the people mm. who need a voice. Mm -hmm. And that's... What, what, what do you take away from that? I mean, because you, you said that the words of Christine McVie sadly passed away from Fleetwood Mac, don't stop. Just listening to Grace now, what do you take away? It just gives me hope that our future generations will be able to learn like amazing people like you and continue to advocate for what needs to be said. Mm. That's lovely. Don't stop. Don't stop. Thank you, Grace. Thank you. If at any point tonight's discussion has raised any issues for you, you can contact 1800 RESPECT or Lifeline on the numbers that you can see there on your screen. And that's all we have time for. Thanks again to our panel. Grace Tame, Allegra Spender, Matt Keane, Nova Peris and Josh Sebs. Please thank you. <laughs> and thanks to you here as well for your questions and for you at home. Not just for your questions, but those stories as well, which are so important to shaping our conversations. Now, this is our final Q&A for the year and our last on a Thursday. We're moving back to Monday nights next year. What's a football on Thursday nights like the rest of you now? <laughs> uh, we'll be back on January 30 at 9.35. Now, we're going to close the show with something pretty special from poet, actor and performer Stephen Oliver. He's here with an ode to something we've talked a lot about tonight, understanding and respect. And what a fit, fitting finish to this year this is. Here he is with an acknowledgement of Stephen. I wish I had infinite wisdom, something meaningful I could impart, like knowledge that's passed through an unbroken chain so long we don't know where it starts. Or maybe compassion that's not dealt in rations but comes from a heart overflowing. For compassion is wise, it sees without eyes, it grants us a depth to our knowing. Loss can be said in hundreds of ways, but is felt only in one. And the love that we feel for the ones in our heart doesn't feel like the love for our mums. Colour won't change how our skin feels the rain. And after it's all said and done, our stories are different, but they're also the same. We all need love from someone. And sure, that's cliche, we all can relate. We all have some story about a terrible first date, or maybe that potential that's now Facebook banned because they wouldn't try and listen or try to understand. Because you see, understanding means feeling at first. And we're not good at feeling, so we hit that reverse. We don't want to get close because we're told not to care. Looking out for yourself is what gets you somewhere. And then what the heck should we even be feeling? And does this feel right? Because it don't feel like healing. And so we stop short at the blame or the shame, not wanting to know how another feels pain. And we lose in that moment what may be the key, the act of acknowledging, of saying, I see. Because there in that moment, what has just been, someone for the first time felt they were seen. So now I acknowledge this country's deep pain. I acknowledge the stains left by many blood rains. I acknowledge the loss, the uncountable costs. I acknowledge the tears children shed for a cross. I acknowledge the rights still often denied. I acknowledge the chance that my elders have cried. I acknowledge that I can't acknowledge it all. So I acknowledge the tears that to this day fall. And now I acknowledge all those who believe that a goodness of spirit is there to retrieve. I'll acknowledge the caring, compassionate ways that helps with the healing towards better days. 
I acknowledge the listing that allows us to see the much needed connection that acknowledges we. For we must acknowledge that where we all stand is a place in which each of us all have a hand to either reach out, to touch and to heal, to teach and support, to help others feel that sees us acknowledge the truth of this earth so we then may acknowledge the truth of its worth. And maybe we'll find that in doing so, that wealth isn't the thing that what we need grow, that what makes us richer is a deeper respect, a felt understanding of how we connect. Colour won't change how our skin feels the rain or the warmth we all feel from one sun. Our stories are different, but they're also the same. Inevitably, our story is one.